Woo! All right. One down. Always one more to go. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing these back to pretty much motherfucking back. Today is Monday, December the 21st, 2020. And this will be the second installment to the Corporate Cowboys podcast. I'm your host, Alex AP, the intern, you know, just another associate, incorporating associates. Um, today's episode, I, I wanted to touch on what it means to be a stand-up guy with the criminal mind. And um, I, was, I was thinking about just what it means to be a stand-up guy with a criminal mind and how I could relate it to the listener, how I could relate it to the follower or the fan or just, you know, the adherent to being a stand-up person but capable of thinking in a criminal manner. I think that goes a long way. It goes a really long way. I should let you know that your guy got an undergraduate degree in sociology at a rather prestigious uh, research university in California. And um, I, well, essentially that, that's what I, I, I thought, I thought I felt like I thrived in there researching um, so the social interactions between individuals, organizations, like individuals, groups, organizations, institutions, governments. Uh, I thought it was, uh, geez, I thought it was a treasure trove of, of just great information. Yeah, I did have to uh, toe the line and uh, I wasn't able to, to speak on exactly it or write or research and investigate into everything I wanted to know and learn about because the university has got its agenda in today's day and age, the 21st century. A lot of it has to do with, um, with just a different mindset, a different culture that's being perpetrated on, on the younger generation, on the younger students who come in. I myself being a little bit older and returning into school from after taking a brief hiatus, I was a little older, a little bit more experienced, a little more worldly, if you will. So I came in with, um, with some pretty, with some pretty, um, hold on, fuck. Hold on, I'm losing my page here. I had a page. Okay, because I, I I have a I have a book here that I want to share that I that I was reading on and that uh, lends itself to today's podcast. Lends itself to today's cast to today's episode. Yeah, today's episode, and it has to do with um with research in a sense. With research and data or data, depending on how you want to say it, so long as you get the point across, so long as you get the message across, I feel like whoever you say it to, whoever you say, however you say data shouldn't be so so snobbish or shouldn't be so, uh, what is it? An ass, an ass and know what you mean by data. But as a young sociology major, I um, I had returned to school <clears throat> after some wild experiences working for corporate, working working in corporate that I wanted to investigate. Um, I wanted to research innovation, innovation within organizations, innovation and also its its opposite, corruption. I thought it was it would be really worthwhile. Little did I know that that though school, though education would give me, you know, just the fundamental understanding of the concepts so that I, I could grapple with them on my own, I I would have to research a lot of these items for myself because 
while I had inducted myself, I had enrolled into an institution of education of academia. And within academia, it's its own whole fucking system of just how uh, how dollars are allotted for how, how dollars are distributed for for research projects for professors to uh, to hire research assistants for for how peer review takes place and whether or not papers uh, after they've been touched by peer reviewers are accepted or required to change and uh, that's just a whole other system that's a that's really a whole other system in which uh, corruption and innovation are at an interplay. So while you might be you know wholesomely writing up a, a thesis and providing your citations, providing your experimental results in order to submit when it comes across the peer reviews board, the peer review board, I believe it's like the IBR. I forget now. I forget. Um, is it the IBRE, the International Board of Research and Ethics, or something like that? But when it comes across whoever oversees research for the institution, so let's say you're at a state university, and uh, then the state university system employs a peer review board where all of their papers in a certain department will say sociology when after they're written up they hit this board and this board uh runs through a, a checklist of items that are required either required to be in the research and the thesis or items that should not be in the research and or thesis they should either satisfy and fulfill them or be struck and out and, and modified. So, yeah, that, that whole system even lends itself to, to agenda in a sense. And I learned a whole bunch of this uh, being a soft science major where hard science like chemistry, like physics, mathematics, anything bordering on, on absolutes and objectivity you can't uh, there isn't much wiggle room. There, there isn't much gray area to work around in and that's honestly probably why I didn't pursue a mathematical degree though I was pretty decent with math coming up in soft science there's a lot more gray area to work with be it psychology sociology anthropology there's a lot more room for not only interpretation but for the shaping of a hypothesis the molding the, the molding of data and uh, just straight up doctoring, yeah, just just straight up modification. Uh, uh, what is it? Nefarious, nefarious modification. Wherever there is an ulterior motive, a an agenda that should be followed, if something should go against the agenda, then it's kicked back by the peer review board and say like, oh, maybe this should be included. You know, this this one facet. This one factor or aspect of of research should be included because it will uh, it will result in the kind of in the kind of paper that that will that will promulgate that will promote the agenda that they have that they have running that'll promote the that'll keep the program that they want running in motion. Now I was I was never a huge fan, and I I do have a, a quick story about my wanting to research it and and uh, just how fucking naive I was to to it all. I took a criminology class, and uh, well, you would think that's rather objective, right? Life and death is pretty fucking objective. Either you're alive or you're not, and then statistics themselves. I figured should be pretty objective too because the number of uh the number of arrests, the number of convictions, those are all documented. You can't say that you've never been convicted if you have been convicted kind of thing like it's going to show up on a hard copy record somewhere. And um while I was in criminology, uh obviously they wanted um the the uh it being it being California, I guess it being progressive or liberal or, or what have you, there there was there was a kind of a one sided 
like a one side to uh, the argument that was highlighted and emphasized and touched on constantly. Yeah, they did. Uh, there was some objectivity, but it was very minimal in the sense that uh, there was there was one side that they're obviously promoting or obviously attempting to instill in the students so that the students will continue uh, along that path of of thought along that path of what's the word i'm looking for along that path of logic did i say that already reasoning and uh and and, and promote and promote it so it might be informed by social justice which let's be real it was it might be informed by social reform criminal justice reform which yeah let's be real it was but not often, not not always was it for the benefit of society. It might have been for the benefit of, uh, of one demographic in society, not all of society. And uh, that, that caused me to question some some things, because if uh, if social reform or criminal justice reform should benefit only one demographic, then on the opposite end, there's a demographic that's either not being addressed or, or not being paid attention to, not not being confronted. And uh, for all we know, those could be the real criminals. Anyways. Um not to get not to get classist, but um I in in criminal in the criminology course, we had to not to, we had to write a we had to research using the universal criminal record the the unified criminal record uh that's that's um rolled out by the fbr by the fbi i'm sorry so it's the ucr uni uniform or unified criminal record that's uh informed by the fbi and released every year let me see if i can't pull that up real quick FBI Uniform Crime Reporting Program, and that's by the FBI. And on it, uh, it's a it's a huge it's a huge database of all the statistics that come in, and uh, they're documented, they're recorded. Not the individual arrests, but but uh, just generally the arrest numbers, the the conviction numbers, and whatnot. Those will come in. So while you can't look at individual cases, yeah, even though usually cases after they're um, after they've after criminals after yeah after suspects have been arraigned and sentenced and convicted, com uh, convicted and sentenced, uh, those are public information. You won't find them on the UCR. The UCR is just for a very uh, broad overview of all of the numbers that come in. And they're all documented and available in a way where um, social researchers like myself are able to go in, uh, play with the data, uh, fudge with the data, and um, create uh, create publications, cr create um, presentations in order to um, in order to justify some sort of policy, some sort of public policy for legislators in order to um, justify some sort of policy reform within the criminal justice system. So yeah, this is used a lot by uh, persons in public policy and uh, public administration. So we had to, in this criminology class, create a thesis or a question uh, regarding the UCR and find uh, a demographic, be it age or, or be it, um, I guess, poverty level or what have you, and find whether or not, and find, uh, find a change, a longitudinal change in time where a change in a, a change in a, a category of crime, like a violent crime or a drug related crime or a white collar crime, where those could uh, those could be hypothesized on and explained in a way 
explained in a way that um that would justify uh our, that would that would either answer our hypothesis and justify a thesis, justify an idea, and and then we would turn it in to uh, to the professor for a grade on just how thorough we were and and how sound our logic was. And I wanted to start obviously with uh, with weapons, with sorry, with gun control, and I wanted to find uh, this is where this is where I. This is where I, I mentioned not not wanting to get classist, but um, I wanted to find how how gun control because let's face it, it's in the it's in some of the most largest populous metropolitan cities, and while on the face, uh, not even on the face, while on the media or yeah, while on the media, they it might be asserted that these cities are the safest places on the world because there's so much police involvement, police activity, there's so many laws against violence and 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 criminals owning guns. I wanted to find why uh, the cities with the most gun control had higher rates of crime and I wanted to find when that started. The hypothesis, the hypothesis question I was working with at the time was whether uh, the implementation of gun of gun laws, the implementation of gun control laws, uh, preceded a spike in violent crime, and it didn't have to be shootings, just a spike in violent crimes and and, and other violent crimes, and I wanted to find if also gun control laws preceded a spike in white collar crimes. Because let's face it, if if gun control laws were really targeted at criminals, then yeah, crim- it would be harder for criminals to uh, to get guns. That's just point blank. But gun control laws, the way they sit now, are more are actually making it more difficult for those who want to follow those gun control laws and uh, be able to to purchase a gun or or, or carry a gun even. So it's becoming a lot more difficult for for the average citizen, the average law abiding citizen to be able to uh, to follow those follow those rules and follow those laws. There's some of those in the politosphere that claim, oh, these this is just an example of rules for thee, not for me or um, rules for the for the for the what is it rules for the poor class, the, the poorer classes, not the elite classes where the elites don't really have to worry about gun laws. They could just hire security who carries guns for them. And the smaller people, I guess, people on the bottom of the totem pole are just shit out of luck. And then the criminals don't give a fuck because who are they to follow laws, right? <laughs> Fucking criminals. And uh, the theory was, uh, the hypothesis was whether or not white collar crime was a trigger was was a trigger like high profile white collar crime whether or not that was a trigger a trigger to to legislate uh harsher stricter gun control and um and my rationale my reasoning behind that is that um even in like in the old west when you walked when you came, when you came into a, uh, a a town or you know a somewhat more legitimate city there were ordinances either posted up by the sheriff so that you had to surrender your weapons on the, on, on the way in and uh, you couldn't walk around with your weapons. And it turns out the sheriff was like the brother or the nephew of the, of the mayor or of the governor even of the state. And, uh, and the mayor or the governor pretty much ran the whole town like in the form of a racket very very mob very mafioso style and uh, obviously they they could run it with impunity they could run it with with iniquity they could you know run it as corrupt or as innovative as they wanted to but let's face it when you get a taste of power a lot of folks do turn corrupt with it and it only makes sense that if some stranger is going to walk into a city you own and you're and you're really fucking milking and profiting off of 
you're going to want that stranger to surrender any form, any way, any manner in which they could defend themselves, protect themselves, or attack you for your corrupt way of being. So I was trying to find a way. I was trying to find a way because I would be using outside resources. I was trying to find, I was going to find a way where I would take the largest cities, find uh, the, find the dates that, that crime, what is it? That gun control had been legislated and then go back a couple of uh, years, maybe up to a decade See if I couldn't find any high profile white collar crime coming out of uh, coming out of investment banks, coming out of investment firms, coming out of uh, out of governmental offices where there might be some usurpation, some some sort of like skimming off the top that was occurring and that people would get mad for and potentially drag motherfuckers out of their office and, you know, dome them, cap them one time. And I wanted to find whether or not there existed some sort of correlation between between them. Now, before we had to, um, before we were authorized on our research projects, we did have to meet with the professor. We and when it came time to meet with the professor, and I explained to them how I wanted to find uh, gun control and tie it into white collar crime. That's when I learned uh, that, no, uh, you cannot be as innovative. You, you cannot be that innovative because uh, it calls into question a lot of institutions. And that's not what they told me word for word. But they said that um, they, well, they really just discouraged my research into it and insisted that I do something else because what I was embarking on uh, did not tie into the course. Which is weird because it's a course called criminology, and I was looking into criminology. I was looking into uh, the. I was looking into more, the the classier, smoother criminals, those that I would, I would, well, love to model my my process on. But at the end of the day, it's just for it's just for documentation purposes. And and finding out whether I had whether I had a reason to pursue that hypothesis and, and see it through. But they, uh, they suggested against it. They told me to uh, essentially look the other way and stick within the scope of, uh, of just the, the very, very basic rudiments that they'd shown us in class. Uh, stick to just age demographics, stick to racial demographics, uh, stick to uh, geographic uh, lo- locations, and um, it was. Uh, it turned out to be a very, very basic assignment. I forget what grade I got on it now. It must have been like a C or a B minus because <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't enthusiastic with it at all. Um, I, I th- believe I still did try to do white collar crime, but I was not able to tie in uh, gun laws into it. And I, I really did think that I had something there where gun laws uh, were white collar crime. You might have more propensity for it to have occurred in the larger cities. I mean, are you going to commit white collar crime on the fucking where in Wyoming or something on the plains? No, it's going to be in a larger city where there's capital flowing through. There's there's cash flow occurring. Money never sleeps. Right. And and rats sometimes will take a will take a whole day or two and not sleep in order to commit their crime. And then if if and when they get found, they might fear retaliation from their victims, from those that they've uh, those that they've suckered into investing with them. And, and in doing so, well, shit, they have enough money already to either pay off the cops or pay, you know, uh, qualify for uh, club fed and, and, and a cushy white collar prison. And I just wanted to learn how all that was tied into. How, how all that was tied together, how, how it was all uh, related. Anyways, this bitch, this bitch, this motherfucker, this professor, it was just one peg, was just one, was just one, 
what is it? Is it uh I forget what the what the teeth it was just one tooth in a gear. Yeah. It was just one tooth in a gear inside of a system of peer review academia. Get it? So they were towing their own line. Why? Because if I call them to question, I, I could essentially call into question their whole fucking profession because them as a criminology professor only teaching the one side, only highlighting the one side and not, you know, not actually addressing what is white collar crime shit that goes on at the elite level. Like that's the shit I want to touch on. That's the shit that I'm that I am interested in. That's that dangerous shit that I would appreciate learning about. Even if it's just to witness. Even, even if it's just to see. I would appreciate uh, uh, just, you know, t- taking a quick peek and, and being able to speak with somebody on a level who understands it and is able to, to di- divulge it, is able to educate me on it. But this professor was obviously not in that position did not want to enjoy that capacity and so steered me and my research my investigation in another direction thus doctoring with the data essentially but she never really had hands on i had the data and she had control of my grade so make of that what you will the book that i that i was reading currently is called uh Big Data, a revolution. Hold on. What's the name of this shit? Big Data, a revolution that will transform how we live, work, and think. It's a book. It's really good. I fucking ran through it and I came across a passage that really, really struck a chord with me as a, as a, as a stand-up guy with a criminal mind, if you if you will, as a criminal, as a corporate cowboy. And this book, Big Data, A Revolution That Will Transform How We Live, Work, and Think, uh, is authored by Victor Mayer Schoenberger and Kenneth Coquier. And uh, just a, a brief synopsis of it is uh, that it's a, a revelatory exploration of the hottest trend in technology and the dramatic impact it will have on the economy, science, and society at large. Which paint color is most likely to tell you that a used car is in good shape? How can, I, how can officials identify the most dangerous New York City manholes before they explode? And how did Google searches predict the spread of the H1N1 flu outbreak? See, those all those questions have to do with data, have to do with statistics, have to do with projection and forecasting. Uh, Those are all terms that are tied into big data and and are the key are the key to answering uh, those those kind of questions, those kind of predictor questions, because the hypothesis behind them, the, the, the thesis behind them is tied soundly to empirical data and that is that's the individual at the ground level where big data offers the bird's eye view the individual data at the ground level is uh when when it's recorded when it's documented much like the ucr done by the fbi uh all that data can be used to uh to infer and hypothesize on which is what i want to do with with relation to, to gun gun control in large cities. Uh, the key to answering these questions and many more is big data. Big data refers to our burgeoning ability to crunch vast collections of information, analyze it instantly, and draw sometimes profoundly surprising conclusions from it. This emerging science can translate myriad phenomena from the price of airline tickets to the text of millions of books into searchable form and uses our increasing computing power to unearth epiphanies that we never could have seen before. A revolution on par with the internet or perhaps even the printing press. Big data will change the way we think about business, health, politics, education, and innovation in the years to come. It also poses fresh threats from the inevitable end of privacy as we know it to the prospect of being penalized for things we haven't even done yet based on big data's ability to predict our future behavior. 
Now that's fucking cold because it says that it poses fresh threats from the inevitable end of privacy as we know it to the prospect of being penalized for things we haven't even done yet. And I doubt that that, that penalization will, will occur. If anything, if anything, it'll be more so steering. It won't be penalizing. It'll be steering much in the form, much in the way that I saw in, in relation and what is it in regards to my research so i while i was never penalized my grade never went down for it i was obviously steered away i was incentivized to not follow it uh why because my professor who's a phd uh (laughs) chose to play ignorant chose to play dumb and not know what i was talking about fucking dumb bitch (laughs) yeah and and uh well, th- this this definitely, this this definitely. Um, what was I gonna say? I got riled up a little bit. Well, in this brilliantly clear, often surprising work, two leading experts explain what big data is, how it will change our lives, and what we can do to protect ourselves from its hazards. Big data is the first big book about the next big thing. And oh yeah, your 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 guy here, your boy, your guy was gonna say, um, the the inevitable end of privacy as we know it. So I, you know, that that was also a large reason, uh, a, a a big reason why I started this podcast for the organization, and that's because the end to privacy. And if I'm gonna be speaking on on the elements to crime, then if if I'm going to be fucking with the elements to crime in a non-taboo manner, then I'm just going to do so openly. You know, uh, none of what I say is legal advice. All of it is done professionally. None of it is, is, should be, none of it is incriminating. Why? Because there is no, there's no conspiracy here. There's no agreement to go out and commit a crime. And really, the the only overt act that's taking place is just talking about it. And I, for one, would like crime, would like violence, would like life and death to not be taboo subjects that we can't talk about. And similar to politics. Nobody wants to fucking talk about politics. I, for one, do not give a shit. Why? Because even in politics, the institution of politics, there exists agents of innovation and agents of corruption and at the end of the day it's just two wings on the same bird both of them either suppressing innovation or promoting innovation and or uh preventing or suppressing corruption and or promoting corruption so i think in in very i feel like i think in uh, like a very abstract manner right but I try to remain as objective as possible. Obviously, I want to do good and be better at the end of the day. Do good and be better. And that means innovating and not corrupting. Though sometimes you got to be a bad guy doing good things, right? <laughs> this passage in the book that, 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 really, uh, that really resonated with me. I'll go over here real quick page 256 page 256 and it's in a section called risks and uh, again the book is called big data a revolution that will transform how we live work and think the section is called the dictatorship of data Ooh, sounds ominous already but that that's not what did it for me listen big data erodes privacy and threatens freedom But big data also exacerbates a very old problem, relying on the numbers when they are far more fallible than we think. Nothing underscores the consequences of data analysis gone awry more than the story of Robert McNamara. For y'all, for those who don't know who Robert McNamara is, how about you just Google the motherfucker because um, because then then you'll find what you'll see what uh, what is it? What's the term called? You'll see what special interest looks like. (laughs) McNamara was a numbers guy. Appointed the U.S. Secretary of Defense when tensions in Vietnam started in the early 1960s. He insisted on getting data on everything he could. 
Only by applying statistical rigor, he believed, could decision makers understand a complex situation and make the right choices. The world, in his view, was a mass of unruly information that if delineated, denoted, demarcated, and quantified, could be tamed by human hand and would fall under human will. So the dude uh, really enjoyed playing God and did so by fucking with numbers, just being a mathematical egghead. Dope. McNamara sought truth. Ah, uh, nice. McNamara sought truth, and that truth could be found in data. Among the numbers that came back to him was the body count. McNamara dele- <laughs> That's the body count. Damn, there's no introduction to what the fucking body count was? Okay. Among the numbers that came back to him was the body count. Um, bah, 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 bah. Hold on, hold on. I'm actually going to go back real quick because where the fuck... Was body count really never really introduced? Okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm in a section of a chapter here, but the body count is just brought up in quotes and uh never <laughs> never um never even introduced like in, in the format or in relation to the vietnam war anyways was it the second war the second world war in the vietnam war uh bet, bet, bet. he applied this word in the second world war okay yeah second world war among the numbers that came back to him was the body count McNamara developed his love of numbers as a student at Harvard Business School and then its youngest assistant professor at 24. He applied this rigor during the Second World War as part of an elite Pentagon team called Statistical Control, which brought data-driven decision-making to one of the world's largest bureaucracies. Damn, that's a fucking word, huh? Bureaucracy? When war becomes a bureaucracy, it's business, baby. Business is war. Prior to this, the military was blind. It didn't know, for instance, the type, quantity, or location of spare airplane parts. Data came to the rescue. Just making armament procurement more efficient saved $3.6 billion in 1943. Modern war was about the efficient allocation of resources. The team's work was a stunning success. And that's really what it is, man. Modern, modern war is uh, is just getting what you need to the right place at the right time in order to use it. At war's end, the group decided to stick together and offer their skills to corporate America. A hey, business war. The Ford Company was floundering, and a desperate Henry Ford II handed them the reins. Just as they knew nothing about the military when they helped win the war, so too were they clueless about car making. Still, the so-called whiz kids turned the company around. McNamara rose swiftly up the ranks, trotting out a data point for every situation. Harried factory managers produced the figures he demanded, whether they were correct or not. Here's where it starts getting fucking juicy, dog. Juicy. McNamara rose swiftly up the ranks, trotting out a data point for every situation. Harried factory managers produced the figures he demanded, whether they were correct or not. <laughs> when an edict came down that all inventory from one car model must be used before a new model could begin production, exasperated line managers simply dumped excess parts into a nearby river. Oh, the corruption, dog. Makes me feel some kind of way. The brass at headquarters nodded approvingly when the foreman sent back numbers confirming that the order had been obeyed. But the joke at the factory was that a fellow could walk on water atop rusted pieces of 1950 and 1951 cars. <laughs> so you see, at the end of the day, big data, big data screwed, bro. When, when you have a human element in big data, when you have a human element in a mechanical process, it's the human element, fam. The human element either wants to appease uh, what is being, wants to appease whoever is demanding of them. And uh, either appease them or advance. And in doing either of those, they're willing to cut corners. They're willing to uh, subvert. They're willing to become corrupted. They're willing to, to act in a, in a corrupt manner. 
Like there was no, there was no sound of innovation there taking place. Like a, a better way to build 1950 and 1951 cars, so that those pieces didn't have to be rusted, or or a way to recycle them or reuse them in a manner that didn't involve just scrapping them and throwing them away. Because it's not even scrapping. Scrapping you, it's, it, it implies that you could take what's useful and uh, and recycle it. And really it was. 1950, 1951, we're talking about uh, high quality, I mean, for the for the time, fucking state of the art, high quality uh, steel pieces or high quality iron uh, uh, iron or and or aluminum. I'm not sure if aluminum was being employed uh, heavily in, in car manufacture then, but, uh, you know, some element, some form of recycling could have happened. McNamara epitomized the mid-20th century manager, the hyper-rational executive who relied on numbers rather than sentiments. So this guy, well, this guy was a facts, don't care, but don't give a fuck about your feelings guy. <laughs> McNamara epitomized the mid-20th century manager, the rational, the hyper-rational, the hyper-rational executive who relied on numbers rather than sentiments and who could apply his quantitative skills to an industry he turned them to, to any industry he turned them to could apply his quantitative skills to any industry he turned them to. Keep in mind, and, and it's true, you could you could make a data point out of any situation and apply this in any, in any industry. Statistics, statistics is the closest, who said this? Statistics is the closest uh, humans can come to, to predicting the future. Using the use of statistics is the closest a human could come to predicting the future. I learned that from uh, from actually an, an, an older uh, an older gentleman, uh, a mentor, a professor, a teacher, if you will. So applying his quantitative skills to any industry he turned them to. In 1960, he was named president of Ford. Look at that. So he came into the business, didn't know shit about it, but in 1960 was named president of Ford, a position he only held for a few weeks before President Kennedy tapped him on the shoulder for Secretary of Defense. President Kennedy appointed him Secretary of Defense. So yeah, there is a... I'm not going to say there's some collusion between uh, those companies then and the war effort or the war, uh, the war economy, but yeah, they, they were going through a war economy then. And... Um, or the, the the beginning of a war economy and needed um, needed help, need statistical help in order for the mill industrial complex, the military industrial complex to to be successful, to fucking blow up, man, blow up, blow up and glow up, as the youngsters today say. As the Vietnam conflict escalated, because this was the 50s, mind you, as the Vietnam conflict escalated and the United States sent more troops, it became clear that this was a war of wills, not of territory. America's strategy was to pound the Viet Cong to the negotiation table. The way to measure progress, therefore, was by number of enemy killed. The body count was published daily in the newspapers. The war's supporters, to the war supporters, it was proof of progress. Damn. Damn. Progress? Yeah, progress. The, the definition of progress must have changed, has changed over time, because progress now does not mean what progress meant then. <laughs> to critics, evidence of its immorality. Evidence of the immorality of war. But I mean, fucking critics. What are they? What are they gonna do? Not publish their, not publish their words on, on machines and 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 systems of media that have that have been created through war. Fam, it's business. The body count was the data point that defined an era. In 1977, two years after the last helicopter lifted off of the rooftop in the U.S. embassy. Lifted off of the rooftop of the U.S. Embassy in Saigon, a retired Army General, Douglas Kennard, published a landmark survey of the General's views called The War Managers. The book revealed a quagmire of quantification. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Called The War Managers, the book revealed the quagmire of quantification what is the quantification quantification is um it's essentially the process yeah it's essentially the process of assigning a data point to uh to a real 
a real statistic and therefore being able to to find uh, be being able to play with that data point in a in a statistical manner. Here, let me let me define it for you real quick. Just the definition of quantification, so you don't have to go too far. It's a noun. It's the act of attaching quantity to anything as the quantification of the predicate. It's the act of determining the quantity. It's the modification by a reference to quantity. It's the introduction of the element of quantity. So just to give you a brief example, I'm going to, uh, in relation to the Vietnam War, example of, hold on, example of Vietnam, of Vietnames, Vietnames. So in the quantification of the war, where the body count was significant, instead of taking, uh, instead of saying, Fan Van Duc, Fan Van Duc died, and uh, the family of Fan also Fam's family also died. Um, Fam, Tran, No, Vu, Du, Dao. Many of, of, of their relatives and friends, neighbors, uh, were also taken down. So instead of saying that, they attach just the fucking number to the guy. It's one. One body. Two bodies. Three bodies. A family of four. Five, including the neighbor. You feel me? So, so they can take... They can literally take the body count... Possibly the region where they had a, a a bombing run and find after they tallied and like this is just funny because they would ha then they'd have to go through and tally the number of people that they bombed the number of people that they killed in order to uh, to have something solid and uh, and if we're dealing with fucking factory managers like in the Ford scenario fam you know uh, it's just some fucking foreshadowing you know what's gonna happen next peep game. A mere 2%. So this book that revealed the quagmire of quantification, a mere 2% of America's generals considered the body count a valid way to measure progress. Around two-thirds said it was often inflated. <laughs> Quote, often fake, totally worthless, wrote one general in his comments. Quote, often blatant lies, wrote another. Quote, they were grossly exaggerated by many units, primarily because of the incredible interest shown by people like McNamara, said a third. <laughs> so because because McNamara was out fucking looking for God. You feel me? He, he wanted to play God, but he's out looking for God. And you know generals are going to be like, yo, I found God today and I fucking killed a fuck ton of them. <laughs> and McNamara is going to believe it because he's looking for God. Like the factory men at Ford who dumped engine parts into the river, junior officers sometimes gave their superiors impressive numbers to keep their commands or boost their careers, telling the higher-ups what they wanted to hear. McNamara and the men around him relied on the figures, fetishized them, with his perfectly combed back hair and his flawlessly tied knotted tie, with his perfectly combed back hair and his Flawlessly knotted tie. Dude, it sounds like this is a fucking, like, they're, they're, they're fetishizing McNamara. Damn, and McNamara was a cuck. <laughs> With his perfectly combed back hair and his flawlessly knotted tie, McNamara felt he could only comprehend what was happening on the ground by staring at a spreadsheet. At all of those orderly rows and columns calculations and charts whose mastery seemed to bring him one standard deviation closer to god <laughs> oh shit okay i don't have i don't have the time to tell you or to to like to teach you what a standard deviation is but to say it has to do with uh, statistics and in statistical calculations, uh, a standard deviation is a measure to uh, just how on the nose you are to a prediction, whether or not it uh, whether or not it, it justifies, it, it agrees with your hypothesis, or or it, it or it goes against your hypothesis. Uh, in, in in any particular situation, in any particular uh, experiment, the use. Abuse and misuse of data by the U.S. military during the Vietnam War is a troubling lesson about the limitations of information in an age of small data. A lesson that must be heeded as the world hurls toward the big era, the big data era, <laughs> the big data era. 
the quality of the underlying data, sorry, the quantity of the underlying data can be poor, it can be biased, it can be misanalyzed and used misleadingly. Even more damningly, data can fail to capture what it purports to quantify. Essentially, what they're not telling you here is that a middle manager can cuck a senior manager by giving them what they want to hear and not actually having made it happen. <laughs> Corruption, baby. Corporate war. All right. And yeah, I mean, this this is intra-corporate war because this is within the organization. This is within the business of the U.S. military, just like it was within the business of Ford. And I'm sure I'm sure Ford suffered in one way or another but they'll likely justify it to their shareholders they'll uh they'll pass the cuck onto the customer by inflating the prices because inflation begets inflation inflation begets extortion extortion is theft added tax asses get taxed tax in that ass feel me the quantity of the underlying data can be poor, it can be biased, it can be misanalyzed and used misleadingly, and even more damningly, data can fail to capture what it purports to quantify. We are more susceptible than we may think to the dictatorship of data, that is, to letting the data govern us in ways that may do as much harm as good. The threat is that we will let ourselves be mindlessly bound by the output of our analysis even when we have reasonable grounds for suspecting something is amiss. Or that we will become obsessed with collecting facts and figures for data's sake, like our boy McNamara. Or that we will attribute a degree of truth to the data which it does not deserve. And, and all of this, again, all, they're, they're just basing this on the fact that the data can be, uh, that, the, that the numbers can be fudged, that the, that the numbers can be doctored, that data can be doctored, and data can always be doctored. But when there is integrity, when there, is, when there are formalities and procedures to uh, secure data, um, then that degree of truth to the data that we could attribute to data, it should be, uh, it should be it's deserving. I mean, it should be respected. And I've seen it. I've seen it work so beautifully. As more aspects of life become datafied, the solution that policymakers and business people are starting to reach for first, hold on, for first is to get, hold on, hold on. This sentence is written wrong. As more aspects of life become datafied, the solution that policymakers and business people are starting to reach for first is to get more data. Are starting to reach for first. There you go. As more aspects of life become datafied, the solution that policymakers and business people are starting to reach for first is to get more data. In God we trust, all others bring data, <laughs> is the mantra of the modern manager, heard echoing in Silicon Valley cubicles, on factory floors, and along the corridors of government agencies. The sentiment is sound, but one can easily be deluded by data. Education seems on the skids. Push standardized tests to measure performance and penalize teachers and schools that by this measure aren't up to snuff. Man, standardized tests have been a fucking just a, a clusterfuck. Standardized tests. I mean, take a if you ever want to if you want to dive down a rabbit hole and I've dived down a ton of rabbit holes. Uh, go ahead and uh, Google standardized tests, the ethics behind them, and uh, like not the ethics of having standardized tests. Like standardized tests are, are are cool, I suppose, for certain institutions, but when the people administering the tests um, aren't cool i guess when they're corrupt or have their own agenda i mean if they want to make teacher of the year you don't think that some standardized tests are gonna get doctored <laughs> or or the way in the way in which uh the instruction is carried out for the standardized test is is gonna be questionable come on whether the test actually capture the abilities of school children the quality of teaching or the needs of a creative adaptable modern workforce is an open question but one that the data does not admit want to prevent terrorism create layers to of watch lists and hold on want to prevent terrorism create layers of watch lists and no fly lists in order to police the skies but whether such data sets offer the protection they promise is in doubt in one famous incident, the late Senator Ted Kennedy of Massachusetts was ensnared by the no-fly list, stopped and questioned, simply for having the same name as a person in the database. 
People who work with data have an expression for those, for some of these problems. People who work with data have an expression for some of these problems. And it isn't just people who work with data. It's fucking eggheads who've never had world experience, like outside experience. And now think that, you know, these literally hallucin- hallucinatory numbers on a screen, this, this data that they're able to pull from the ether, apparently, because you can literally just make it up in your nebulous mind, pass it up to your higher manager <laughs> and get a bonus at the end of the year. <laughs> Uh, they don't understand. Okay, so it's garbage in, garbage out. Yes or no? Right? People who work with data have an express people who work with data have an expression for these kinds of problems? Bruh, please. Garbage in, garbage out. In certain cases, the reason is the quality of the underlying information. Often, though it is the misuse of the analysis that is produced. With big data, these problems may arise more frequently or have larger consequences. Google, as we've shown in many examples, runs everything according to data. They literally do run like their whole organization just according to data. And bro, there's got to be some dark agents in there. Some, some agents, some nefarious agents just fucking with data. I can only imagine. And, and I hope some of those are stand up. Stand up. <laughs> That strategy has obviously led to much of its success, but it also trips up the company from time to time. Its co-founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, long insisted on knowing all job candidates' SAT scores and their grade point averages when they graduated from college. In their thinking, the first number measured potential and the second measured achievement. Accomplished managers in their 40s who were being recruited were hounded for the scores to their outright bafflement. Because motherfuckers who are experienced, motherfuckers in their 40s, they haven't need, needed to rely on a SAT score or a grade point average for anything else. Why? Because they've gotten to a point in their life, whether they've uh, gotten to a point of accomplishment or achievement in their, at a point of their life where they don't need those numbers. They have a reputation, dog. The company even continued to demand the numbers long after its internal studies showed no correlation between the scores and job performance. So you see, that's just Larry Page and Sergey Brin cucking to the numbers, bro. <laughs> that's just that's me say like say I that's just me paying off. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to implicate. I don't want to incriminate a uh, university. That's me paying off some university or college uh, uh, administration, some registrar to add me to their roster and just uh, give me a SAT score, give me a grade point average that I could pay for. And then I could get a job at Google. I could get a, a what is it? Like a, I don't know what the SAT scores are because I don't, I don't think I ever took the SAT, but my grade point average say I could just pay for a 4.0 and I could pay for, for the highest, the highest percentile on the SAT. And, uh, and I walk into Google the next day and, you know, and I'm not going to say they'd be S in my D, but <laughs> bro, I'd, I'd get a job just based on those two numbers. Apparently Google ought to know better to resist being seduced by data's false charms. The measure leaves little room for change in a person's life. It fails to count knowledge rather than book smarts. Eh, see, it may not reflect the qualifications of people from the humanities where know-how may be less quantifiable than in science and engineering. So just because, ju- just, just because, uh, never mind. It, it may reflect the qualifications of, uh, it may not reflect, it may not reflect the qualifications of people from the humanities uh, side of life where know-how may be less quantifiable than it being done in science and engineering. So essentially what it's saying is that it's a little, it's harder to quantify a soft science. It's harder to quantify a soft science than it is to quantify a hard science. And I'm pretty sure I said this at the outset of the episode where, yeah, I mean, when you're in, in a more subjective study like sociology, like a soft science, Bro, quantifying is the easiest thing in the world. Well, if you're if you can doctor it, if you're a fucking liar, if you're if you're a corporate cowboy, all you have to do is fucking lasso and wrangle any fucking number you want, 
And if you're able to justify it with a suitable hypothesis, you could doctor the data that comes to you in a fashion that will mold around your hypothesis forcefully, motherfucking brute force. <laughs> And in and, and science, in science and engineering, you can't do that because if you're off by a millimeter, if you're off by a micrometer, it's disaster, my guy. Fucking disaster. Google's obsession with such data for HR purposes is especially queer considering that the company's founders are products of Montessori schools, which emphasize learning, not grades. <laughs> And it repeats the mistakes of past technology powerhouses that vaunted people's resumes above their actual abilities. And and I get it, bro. I mean, shit. That, there's literally kids. I mean, and, and, and kids. Yeah. Folks say that this generation is fucking lost because they're just being thrown. They're, they're being pulled. They're being sucked into higher education without a fucking clue of what they want to do. All on the grounds that it's the next step that you need that that you need the undergraduate degree that you need the bachelor's that you need the master's, but they don't know what fucking field to get into, so they go with something easy, something uh, soft science, if you will. And soft science, fucking sociology, was not easy by any extent, but you can you can literally pass with a C. C's get degrees in that bitch, and and if and if you are if you are. If you are not actively, if you're not actively questioning life when you're going through there, because I, I'm going to be honest, like I, I returned to education questioning life itself, bro. And, and everything I learned in there, I took with a grain of salt. There was some shit that I found to be outright ridiculous, but I was able to pass the course with either an A or a B. Why? Because I could memorize and recite, but my my thinking brain, my motherfucking, my motherfucking logic brain, obviously had red flags popping up. And, and, and you can see this in, in, my, in my record, in my academic record. The first semester in my, because I started at the, at, was a community college, and then I transferred uh, with, uh, with, uh, with an associate's degree into uh, into a higher education and and uh, my first semester my first semester there was the lowest i've ever had my gpa and that all had to do why because i felt like i i felt like i was at a at a higher i believed i was at a higher level school i believed that was at a more prestigious school they 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 vaunted they vaunted themselves as a research as a research uh, uh school and and so whenever i raised questions about outside sources whenever i raised questions that weren't peer reviewed by the school system <laughs> bro i caught flack so Obviously, my my GPA suffered a bit because they knew I was a I was a, a calcitrant. I was a recalcitrant student, and 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 I would question any bullshit that was being thrown at these kids. And these kids, like nobody else, would raise their hands. There was even a time where like I would just meet like other random kids in like future courses, and they're like, "Oh yeah, I know you." They would know me. They would know me because I asked questions. Like, I, yeah, I, I know you. You you ask a lot of questions, or you get into arguments with the professor. Into, into discussions i'm sorry into into debates <laughs> and i was it's not like i was wasting uh the the class's time yeah they uh you could say they paid for for the time to be in class but bro these kids literally these kids are taking on a a, fu a fucking idiotic number of loans a, a stupid number of loans and are lost in school. Don't know what they want to come out doing. I have another story on that, actually. I, I did some social research while I was at community college and while I was at, at the higher, at the at the four-year school. And um, and yeah, I, I put my fucking sociology degree to work. Even while I was studying for sociology, I would interview uh, students and find uh, what they were studying for, what their, uh, what their previous, what their past experiences were in relation to the field and what they wanted to do when they get out. And the answers uh, would scare you. Okay, my bad. Um, I digress. Uh, people who work, ba, 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 people who work with the thing, the SAT score, the grade point average. Uh, where is it? Where am I? 
Yeah, Google's obsession. Google's obsession with such data for HR purposes is especially queer considering that the company's founders are products of Montessori schools, which emphasize learning, not grades. And it repeats the mistakes of past technology powerhouses that vaunted people's resumes above their actual abilities. And and fuck, that just gets me. Why? Because I, I hear it all the time from, from my older colleagues, from my older associates who who, who work in, a, in capacity that they need they need motherfuckers who know what to do and and hr will maybe it's a fucking the ineptitude of hr but hr will just go out and 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 superficially interview candidates and find what their fucking sat score and their gpa was maybe won't even ask for a letter of recommendation very few organizations do nowadays and and even those i mean you, you, you could be a, a a piss poor student and still get a glowing letter of recommendation ask your boy how he did it <laughs> um uh yeah they're they're literally just hiring on these two numbers not getting anything anything uh, uh qualifiable there's there's quantitative inf- there's quantitative data and there's qu- qualitative data but they're not getting anything qualitative out of these candidates they're literally just going for the quantitative numbers why because they're also fulfilling a quota they're also fulfilling a demand they're they're also just following orders of what's being demanded of them and they're cucking the ceo they're cucking the cfo and they're doing so why because it's it, they're just dumping spared 1950 1951 parts into the job market into the workplace when these motherfuckers aren't qualified <laughs> Ah, oh, shit. <clears throat> yeah. And, and um, yeah, it, it repeats the mistakes of past technology powerhouses that vaunted people's resumes above their actual abilities. Would Larry and Sergey as PhD dropouts? Oh, how fucking nice. They, they chose not to go for the PhD. Well, they probably have honorary doctorates now. You just got to donate a significant sum of money to a school and you can get an honorary PhD. Like a certain first something elect, first elect somebody something. <laughs> By Google standards, not Bill Gates, nor Mark Zuckerberg, nor Steve Jobs would have been hired. You see? Because they all dropped out. So by Google standards, not Bill Gates, nor Mark Zuckerberg, nor Steve Jobs would have been hired since they lack college degrees. How fucking nice. The firm's reliance on data sometimes may seem overblown. Marissa Mayer, when she was one of its top executives, once ordered staff to test 41 gradations of blue to see which ones people used more to determine the color of a toolbar on the site. Google's preference, no, hold on, Google's deference Google's deference to data has been taken to extremes, even though choosing the right hue earned Google millions, according to an engineer. In fact, Google's obsession even sparked revolt. And this is a uh, this gets down really to to, to hair splitting, to to really to to the obsession of of taking polls, of taking surveys. Um, finding finding which gradation of blue is most appealing to the eye, which gradation of blue might cause a person to to move their mouse in that direction in order to get a click. Yeah, I mean Google Google does it all. Um, I mean there's other companies that do it, but Google, a company that operates exclusively on the use of data. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't doubt that all of that is, is, is in there. And if you're using a phone, yeah, like Google watches where your fucking retinas go. They, 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 they watch where your eyeballs blink. They watch exactly what you look at, how you scroll, how you scroll, how long it takes you to get to a place, whether you remember on a page where you found it. So, yeah, it's it's calculating. It's calculating all of that, all of it. It, it, it calculates what you take in, how and why. Let's say that, and 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 based on that, it could essentially predict your. It could predict your emotion. It, it could calculate your emotion, predict and forecast your future actions. Cool, huh? In fact, Google's obsession even sparked revolt. 
In 2009, Google's top designer, Douglas Bowman, quit in a huff because he couldn't stand the constant quantification of everything. Quote, I had a recent debate over whether a border should be three, four, or five pixels wide and was asked to prove my case. I can't operate an environment like that. <laughs> he wrote in a blog announcing his resignation. Dude. And it's hard, yeah, it's fucking, it's fucking difficult. It's cutthroat like a motherfucker. When shit gets to that point where you have to make a case to why a border should be three, four, or five pixels wide, you're, 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 you, the level of evidence you have to have to back up a decision at that level, dude, it has to be razor, razor thin, razor sharp. Why? Because uh, uh, otherwise, it otherwise it has to be a complete lie a total fucking lie and you lose google money and you get fired and you get murked out who fucking knows right when a company is filled with engineers it turns to engineering to solve problems quote that, that that's a quote uh reduce its decision to a simple logic pattern that data eventually becomes a crutch for every decision paralyzing the company now google hasn't been paralyzed yet and i get the feeling that um that they're turning ai onto the public and really doing what i'm what i just said predicting or attempting to predict but my guy humans 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 are like one of the least predictable one of the most routine, one of the least predictable. Brilliance doesn't depend on data. Steve Jobs may have continually improved the Mac top laptop, the Mac top laptop. <laughs> Brilliance doesn't depend on data. Steve Jobs may have continually improved the Mac laptop over years on the basis of field reports, but he used his intuition, not data, to launch the iPad, the iPod, and the iPhone. I said those out of order, but fuck you. He relied on his sixth sense. Oh, damn, I got another episode uh, on that, just a sixth sense. But it's, it's intuition. It's shit that you cannot predict. It's shit that you cannot forecast. It's not data. That's essentially what, got, what made Steve Jobs Steve Jobs. It, it, quote, it isn't the consumer's job to know what they want. He said famously when telling a reporter that Apple did no market research before releasing the iPad. So either, either the dude's lying, right? Because I'm sure they use some market research or they should have at least, or he's got fucking balls. He released something that he wanted to see out in the market, which is what I'm doing with this podcast. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm nowhere like nowhere like Steve Jobs. God forbid I should be like fucking Steve Jobs. But I'm releasing into the market what I want to hear, and I don't hear podcasts like my own. I need, I need, I need to fucking, I need to, to, I need to hear about crime, bro. I need to hear about violence. I need to hear about innovation and corruption. And there's just there aren't there's just podcasts that report podcasts that report, but there aren't podcasts that that investigate. There aren't podcasts that explore. In the book, seeing like a state. The anthropologist James Scott of Yale University documents the ways in which governments and their fetish for quantification and data end up making people's lives miserable rather than better. They use maps to determine how to reorganize communities rather than learn anything about the people on the ground. <laughs> Welcome to communism, blood. <laughs> they use long tables of data about harvest to decide to collectivize agriculture without knowing a wit about farming. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking communism, bro. <laughs> they take all of the imperfect organic ways in which people have interacted over time and bend them to their needs, sometimes to justify a desire for a quantifiable order, <laughs> the use of data in Scott's view often serves to empower the powerful. Yeah, bro, that's fucking communism. That's fucking fascism. Whatever the fuck you want to call it. It's just just authoritarianism, right? Just motherfuckers who want to be in control. Motherfuckers who want to be in power and have no fucking idea where that power comes from. Have no fucking idea what to do with the control. They just want the control, but they're, they're like the jokers at the top. Wow. They are the jokers at the top. They're like a dog. I'm like a dog. Barking and chasing a car. <laughs> but I wouldn't know 
the first thing to do with the car if I ever caught one. <laughs> oh shit, dude. <laughs> yeah, so that's essentially these cats. That these fucks that we have in Congress, like uh I would I would argue that a large majority, a large majority what a fucking paradox, what a conundrum, what a oxymoron, a large majority, a large minority. I would say the majority. The majority, the absolute majority of them. <laughs> Don't know how to use control. Don't know where the fuck power comes from. <laughs> Don't know how to use power. The data, the use of data in Scott's view often serves to empower the powerful. This is the dictatorship of data writ large. And it was a similar hubris that led the United States to escalate the Vietnam War partly on the basis of body counts, rather than to base decisions on more meaningful metrics. See, hey, hey, keep in mind, like, people want to say that the Vietnam War was lost because it was one of the first to be aired on television and, and, and really, really exposing just what war is. But, bro, we've been desensitized to blood, guts, and gore to fucking sex, drugs, and violence for the fucking longest. Forever. We're humans, dog. We, 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 did, we did this shit coming up. And, and now they want to say, like, the, the Vietnam War was lost for, for nothing, for something other than, than the metrics. Yeah, I mean, I believe it. Why? Because there's mo there's humans, there's motherfuckers in in the ranks who who want to take credit for shit they never did, like uh like pumping up those numbers. You gotta pump up those numbers, man. Those are fucking those are fucking rookie numbers. So obviously they're gonna report. You know, if they dropped one bomb, they killed like uh they killed a whole hillside when that's just not true, right? It is true enough, quote, it is true enough that not every conceivable complex human situation can be reduced to the lines on a graph or to percentage points on a chart or to figures on a balance sheet, said McNamara in a speech in 1967 as domestic protests were growing. But all reality can be reasoned about. And not to quantify what can be quantified is only to be content with something less than the full range of reason. Now, I do get, I, I do get the sentiment that McNamara is trying to ev evoke here, and that's to say that that quantification, quantifying data, is just another resource, and it's true. It, it's 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 another it's another resource. It's another aspect. It's another factor to consider. And and to and to go about war to to go about business business is war to go about war without quantifying anything without without you know without relying to some extent without giving without conceding to to quantification without conceding some power to the power of quantification some respect without respecting quantification it's to operate with less than the full range of reason it's just another aspect it's just another resource if only the right data were used in the right way not respected for data's sake because when you do some shit for data's sake you'll do anything to justify data you'll you'll <laughs> You'll do anything to justify data. A, a, a gangster one told me, a gangster one told me one time told me, be careful about people who justify their crimes using God's sake. For God's sake, be careful for people who justify their crimes using God's sake. And uh, yeah, this was a reformed gangster, a church-going gangster. And yeah, I mean, the the, the dude was right. <laughs> Robert Strange McNamara, strange middle name. Robert Strange McNamara went on to run the World Bank throughout the 1970s, then painted himself as a dove in the 1980s. How um, that sentence, well, just the way I've been reading and then how, the way that sentence reads. <laughs> Robert, Mac, Robert Strange McNamara went on to run the World Bank throughout the 1970s, then painted himself as a dove in the 1980s. He became an outspoken critic of nuclear weapons and a proponent of environmental protection. Later in life, he underwent an intellectual conversion, intellectual conversion, and produced a memoir in respect that criticized the thinking behind the war and his own decisions as Secretary of Defense. We were wrong, terribly wrong. He wrote, but he was referring to the war's broad strategy. <laughs> 
<laughs> so even then, the guy is going to rationalize the the, the guy is going to rationalize his involvement, even though he might have he might have got cucked on the numbers by some by some subordinates. He's he ain't going to claim he was wrong. Nah, bro, the the numbers were wrong. <laughs> On the question of data and of body counts in particular, he remained unrepentant. He admitted many of the statistics were misleading or erroneous, but things you can count, these are quotes, things you can count, you ought to count. Loss of life is one. McNamara died in 2009 at the age of 93, a man of intelligence, but not of wisdom. Damn, this book fucking burned his ass. <laughs> oh, shit. And, uh, I'm about, I'm about, um, I'm about a, fuck, it's already been an hour and I haven't even given my ad. What's today's ad on? Today's ad is on, um, calculators. Yeah. Calculators because it's on topic. It's on theme. And what you can do with calculators is literally magic. Magic. I tell you. Why? Because when you hit the one and then hit the plus sign and then hit the one again, when you hit enter, those two ones fucking disappear. Fucking disappear and become only one number. Matt, can you, can you, I don't know if you can conceive of that. If, if you can understand the implications this has to quantification and, and, and data. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I know this isn't a specific ad read and it's super late into the episode, but I give a fuck. Why? Because I have no real sponsors right now. And, um, and if in the future I have one, I'll be a slightly more respectful. Uh, I'll, I'll have, I'll have a little bit more respect for the ad and it's timing. <laughs> one more, one more. So in your, uh, in your calculator, you want to take, uh, you want to hit, how does it go? I think it's, uh, if you, if you add, if you type in five, three, one, eight, zero, zero eight and then flip it upside down hold on did i say that right no 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 wait 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 you type in eight zero zero eight one three five flip that shit upside down and it should um and and you don't even have to hit uh enter so there's magic without even doing an equation imagine that (laughs) ah immature shit bro but you know not working in corporate, going back to school, and I'm not even working with math right now. Um, it's uh, it's it's something else, man. Uh, I just had to sneak that little nugget there. Um, let's see, wrapping this shit up. Big data, big data may lure us to commit the sin of McNamara. Ooh, how fucking grave! To become so fixated on the data and so obsessed with the power and promise it offers that we fail to appreciate its limitations. To catch a glimpse of the big data equivalent of the body count, we need only look back at Google flu trends. And uh, yeah, because this is a chapter in the middle of this book, it it makes reference to uh, previous experiments and previous evaluations of companies and organizations who use big data in in, in their operations and uh, and how it's either helped them or how it's hurt them. And um. And yeah, it, it just makes mention of Google flu trends where uh, Google apparently, similar to what Bill Gates did with the coronavirus, uh, Google flu trends uh, has a way of like tracking uh, a contagion in a large populous city and uh, and then even even making suggestions to officials on, on how to best, um, how, on how to best triage, how to best approach triage to it through um what is it through quarantine or or treatment or some shit consider a situation not entirely implausible in which a deadly strain of influenza rages okay so just gonna go into it now okay fucking sorry consider a situation not entirely implausible in which a deadly strain of influenza rages across the country medical professionals would be grateful for the ability to forecast in real time the biggest hot spots by dint of search queries they'd know where to intervene with help uh, and essentially, yeah, it, it's just it's basing it off of like real time, uh, real time data analysis of people when they look up, uh, when they go into their into their 
uh, search engine and they type into the query box, uh, what what are the symptoms of the cold or what are the symptoms of the flu or how to get rid of a cough or uh, best treatments, uh, teas for a flu, uh, best treatment, how to make chicken noodle soup, shit like that. They're able to, to cross analyze all those fucking all those searches within that, that are made within like a city block or a, a county even. And, and then and then able to analyze where there's an outbreak, where there is a, a spread, maybe even where there's, there's an origin, all through cross-referencing big data. I mean, it's got some it's got some good use. It's got some fucking uses for it, right? Uh, they know where to intervene with help, where to intervene with help. But suppose that in a moment of crisis, political leaders argue that simply knowing where the disease is likely to get worse and trying to head it off is not enough. So they call for a general quarantine, not for all people in those regions. I just fucking said that. I'm sorry. So I, I read this book a while ago and it reminded me, um, I forget what reminded me of this particular section, this particular chapter, but I had to, I had to read it for y'all. And uh, now it's just, now I'm saying, now I'm duplicating the shit and then I'm reading it to you again. I'm sorry. But suppose, but suppose that in a moment of crisis, political leaders argue that simply knowing where the disease is likely to get worse and trying to head it off is not enough. So they call for a general quarantine, not for all people in those regions, which would be unnecessary and overboard. Big data allows us to be more particular. So the quarantine only applies. So the quarantine applies only to the individual internet users whose searches were most highly correlated with having the flu. And if you were asking why that's not happening in the time of Corona, um, it's because of control, dog. Are you fucking serious right now? It's not containment. <laughs> Well, it's containment of yourself in your fucking home, but it's not containing of the corona. Get the fuck out of here. Here, we have the data on whom to pick up. Federal agents on, on whom to pick up? Hold on, what? Here, we have the data on whom to pick up. So we would just be picking up motherfuckers on the street now, huh? Federal agents armed with armed with a list of internet protocol addresses, armed with IP addresses and mobile GPS information, heard the individual internet web searchers into quarantine centers heard them huh heard them so <laughs> like cattle <laughs> damn way to take the job of the corporate cowboys dude but as reasonable as this scenario might sound to some it is just plain wrong correlations do not imply causation yo this this has been hard proven correlations do not always imply causation these people may or may not even have the flu they would have to be tested they'd be prisoners of a prediction but more but more important they'd be victims of a view of data that lacks an appreciation for what the information actually means and uh, it's true. Um, uh, it, it's not so much true on 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 what the information would actually mean, because if it's all done with integrity and and if and if it's and then if there's some security on this data, then yeah, I mean, you know, you could easily find an outbreak, and the correlation would necessarily would necessarily have to imply causation. But but I think what what they did here was was to just hairball like a huge ball of fucking yarn. All of this shit, like not just the possible flu, but then the, uh, but then uh, it's it's results and and it, and it's um and it's approaches to fucking federal agents armed with list of internet of internet protocol addresses and mobile GPS information. You think that's the only thing they're gonna be armed with? Like they they just wanted to uh, bankroll. They, they they wanted to bankroll the federal agents rounding motherfuckers up with saying that the correlation of these internet searches of these web searches don't imply the causation of it. Like and that doesn't make any fucking sense, bro. Because. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of lending, it's kind of lending, it's, it's, it's lending, what, what's it called? It's, it wants to create the benefit of the shadow of a doubt, right? It wants to create the benefit of the shadow of a doubt that the federal agents wouldn't be required if the data was right. And, and essentially what it's saying is that if the data if, if, if the data was wrong then these federal agents would be uh, would be doing something unconstitutional right because it, uh, these these would be prisoners of a prediction and and not and not actual reality 
But if the data was right, I think it would make sense. It, it would it would definitely it would make sense to imply there's a causation there. But the fucking approach, it's it's the approach that they're trying to justify with the federal agents where they're saying that that uh, that that where, where they're calling into question the legitimacy of all the data. Yeah, it's 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 like a it's it's like a dead man switch where if we can't use the federal agents, we can't use the data. Fucking <laughs> got it. Fucking right, nailed it. Nailed that shit on the twenty. On the motherfucking one. Uh, yeah, if we can't use the federal agents, we can't use the data. The data is not good. <laughs> Uh, the point of the actual Google flu trend study is that certain search terms are correlated with the outbreak, but the correlation may exist because of circumstances like healthy coworkers hearing sneezes in the office and going online to learn how to protect themselves, not because the searchers are ill themselves. And um, that's just that's just ubiquitous because if somebody is searching up like sneezes and in, in the work instead of saying bless you or yo get checked out or yo fucking go home or yo shut the fuck up you've sneezed like seven times already there has to be more than just one search of like sneezes and 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 the search would have to be specific and Google being a data driven organization would have to cross-reference something more than just uh, what does a sneeze mean get the fuck out of here okay my bad <laughs> oh man this this winter break this christmas break this uh this break before my return yeah you'll notice that these episodes are back to fucking back and and that's just because i want would like to have would like to give people uh, uh, a short catalog of things to listen to because when uh, when I return to my education, um, these things will drop off to maybe once or twice a week. I'll try to do them as often as possible, but I won't guarantee. I can't guarantee more than two a week. Okay, um, if I, if on the off chance there's a third, it might be an interview with a third person. It might be a special guest or some shit. But it won't, yeah, it, uh, I'll just be, I'll be inundated with work, inundated with work and other side work. Um, the next section, sorry. So after, after the dictatorship of data section, there's a the next section before the end of the chapter and it's the dark side of big data. Fucking even more ominous. Okay. <laughs> As we have seen, big data allows for more surveillance of our lives while it makes it, sorry, if you're just joining us now, if for whatever reason, if you were just fucking join us, joining us now, um, the book I'm reading is Big Data, colon, a revolution that will transform how we live, work, and think. So the title is Big Data, a revolution that will transform how we live, work, and think. And the author is Victor Mayor Schoenberger and Kenneth Coquier. Um, and I'm at the uh, I'm at page two sixty six. Yeah, is it two sixty six? And the section is the dark side of big data. As as we have seen, as we have seen. Big data allows for more surveillance of our lives while it makes some of the legal means for protecting privacy largely obsolete. It also renders ineffective the core technical method of preserving anonymity. Just as unsettling, big data predictions about individuals may be used to, in effect, punish people for their propensities, not their actions. This denies free will and erodes human dignity. I'm not going to comment on that because I'm uh, I have... Uh, really strong feelings on on um, eroding human dignity, <laughs> on corrupting and innovating the human will, the, the, the free will. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and just read that section one more time. I'm going to read that little paragraph one more time, a little slower, a little bit more serious, so you can infer and you can think uh, your own thought, and um, and then we'll wrap up this episode. As we have seen, Big data allows for more surveillance of our lives while it makes some of the legal means for protecting privacy largely obsolete. It also renders ineffective the core technical method of preserving anonymity. Just as unsettling, big data predictions about individuals may be used to, in effect, punish people for their propensities, not their actions. This denies free will and erodes human dignity. 
At the same time, there is a real risk that the benefits of big data will lure people into applying the techniques where they don't perfectly fit or into feeling overly confident in the results of the analysis. As big data predictions improve, using them will only become more appealing, fueling an obsession over data since it can do so much. That was the curse of McNamara and is the lesson his story holds. We must guard against over-reliance on data rather than repeat the error of Icarus who adored his technical power of flight but used it improperly and tumbled into the sea. In the next chapter, we'll consider ways that we can control big data lest we be controlled by it. And Icarus, for those who don't know, uh, he, he, yeah, he adored his technical power of flight because he strapped um, like some some um what do you call it some prosthetic wings he strapped he created prosthetic wings and strapped them to himself and was able to take flight i don't know if this is a legend or a myth and uh he was able to take flight it's a fucking legend myth now that i think about it because he flew too close to the sun and his wings um went up <laughs> his wings um uh, fell apart and he crashed into the sea apparently i would say he crashed on land because that how do I hurt more? But he crashed in the sea. Probably got fucked up by a shark or some shit. <clears throat> that about wraps up the second episode of the Corporate Cowboys. And really, I'll just... Uh, I should be titling this one Big Data because... Boys and girls, Big Data is where it's at. It's apparently the future and us as humans... Traveling into the future, we are four-dimensional beings, and thus, an error in big data. You're welcome. Take that as you will. Corrupt it or innovate it. Big data, I mean. And uh, fucking do work as a corporate cowboy. I'll explain more later. See you next time.